So in this clip I am going to talk about some very basic issues about time series data which I suspect most of you will have come, uh, come across during your undergraduate days or early in uh, econometrics so, but there's no harm just uh, revising or reminding you of a few of these. To do this I'm going to use two data sets, US GDP data and exchange rate data, US dollar euro rates and they are in these two Excel files now in MATLAB. I'll just nip that into shape. So here in MATLAB I have these, you can see I have these two files in my folder. I'm just creating a little script file where I start with importing the US GDP data. Let me just uh, do that in the first place. Of course, uh, you will know by now how to import data into MATLAB. The data are going to be in US GDP. With text, I'll have date information. Let me just look at both of these the text and US GDP. So you can see here we have four observations of 47, you can see that's January, April, July, October, so that's quarterly data. And these are US GDP data. Now whenever you are dealing with data, if you have the chance, you should look at them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this and uh, click on plot. And here are our US GDP data. So let me just copy that graph across to our uh, work board. So here, here it is. Let's look at the numbers we we can see here on the on the axis. So I can see these are numbers hand between about 15 and about 115. So what's that mean? These are US GDP data. What's the meaning of 100 or 80? So it turns out that these are what we call index data. Okay? And often you will find uh, you will find numbers like that um, published as index data. Well, let's just look at uh, MATLAB again. So here you can see the observations. They start at around 14 and they finish up at about 110 at the end of the sample. The end of the sample is in the second quarter 2010 here. Now when you have index number, the number 100 has a particular meaning. Let's go back to the graph. Number 100 is about here. Okay. So let's see which year that, were, that was in. I'll go back here. Here we can see that 100, we don't have a value exactly 100, but we have here a few around 100, so let's look, 233, so that's 2005, 233 to 236 is 2005. So these index numbers are usually set such that the GDP, say in 2005, is equal to 100. Now we have quarterly data. Since we have quarterly data, we don't have one particular quarter that's exactly equal to 100. But you can see that basically the more or less the average of the 2005 data will be equal to 100. So and you can see the value now always goes up. So what's the meaning of this value? Let me first abstract from, from these values. Let's go back to our little example. Let's say GDP in 2005 would be 100. So what if the index number said that GDP in 2006, say, was 104? Well, that would imply that we have had from 2005 to 2006 we had a growth of four percentage point okay so the index increased by four percent 
Now, let's go back. What does it mean, GDP in 2005 of 100? So it's an index. That means that number by itself doesn't really have a meaning. So let's actually find out what was the GDP in 2005 in the US. So I'll go to a little useful search engine for these sorts of things as well from Alpha. So I'll just ask what was US GDP in 2005 and it will think for a little and it comes up 12.9 trillion okay 12.9 trillion so about 13 trillion dollars okay so let me just write this down 13 trillion dollars. Now, 13 trillion, what is that? That is the same as 13 and 12 zeros. Okay, now, I'll squeeze them on here. Hopefully that still fits on it. So this is about this. Now, I, I have really trouble imagining these numbers, so I actually looked up again uh, on the internet. What does one trillion dollar look like? Well, here we have 100 pound signs, a pile, a little pile of 100 pound bills, a uh, 100 dollar bills is uh, $10,000. This little pile here is a hundred million dollar. These pallets, 10 pallets here are one billion dollar. And you can see the little man here in the corner all these pallets are one trillion. So the US generated, US economy generated in one year 13 of these fields of $100 bills. Just thought uh, you may be interested what it means. So, however, what we were asking is what is now the GDP in 2006? Well, it's 4% larger than 13 trillion. So what is 1% of 13 trillion? So 1% is 130 billion and that times 4 is uh, 260, 520 billion. So in the next year we will have 13 and plus 520 billion. And that. So that's about 13.5 <coughs> excuse me 13.5 trillion dollars now I guess you will agree with me that dealing with these numbers these index numbers is somewhat easier than dealing with these numbers and that's the very reason why we are transferring data into indices okay so because when we are dealing, when we want to look at the GDP data, it's much nicer to have this set of data than uh, all these different zeros. So that's what basically index numbers are. Now let us look at a very common data transformation. That's the log transformation. And we first look at this. And we often use this for data exactly like GDP. You can see here that there is clearly a trend in this data, but this trend isn't a linear trend. It's something, not exactly, but something like an exponential trend. Now, quite often we, we do like dealing with data that develop in a linear sense for, for all sorts of different reasons. The way how to do that is to transform form the GDP into log GDP. So let me just create a new series and I'll call it LGDP. GDP and that is equal to log of US GDP. So I'll uh, execute this uh, line. So we have, oh, that's uh, a typo, US GDP, of course. So an it is here. Let's look at this. We highlight it and click on plot. Now you can see this series has a much more linear trend, although of course it's not exactly linear. 
Okay, you can of course see that um, the the crow freight in the early parts of the sample was larger and it has flattened out somewhat later. So this is why we often use uh, log GDP. We will we'll use the log in just a moment again. The second type of transformation we need to, to look at, sorry, well, let me just write this down. We often use the logarithm and we usually use the natural one. Okay, and in MATLAB, the log function, log x, calculates exactly the natural log. So, and we do that to transform data that are exponentially trending into data that are linearly trending. So the next important transformation we want to look at are differences. differences, okay, or changes in series. So let's just think of a data series Y at time T. That could be the US GDP data. It could be whatever you want. So think about this. Basically what we, let me just take away the time index. So we have a series Y and if we have a, a series as we have here in MATLAB instance yes GDP this is really a vector of data so let's write it down as a vector of data we have first observation second observation third observation all the way down to say the nth observation now if we want to calculate the differences the symbol we use is this little delta so delta y what would that be well we'll just need a series of differences. Now y1, how is that a change from the previous value? Well we don't have the previous value so the first difference is how the series changes from y1 to y2 and how does it change? y2 minus y1. Then the next difference is how it changes from y2 to y3. How do we calculate that? y3 minus y2 and so forth up to the last possible change and that we would calculate yn minus yn minus 1. Now there's not one, so, so far, so far, so straightforward, but one important thing we should remember, that vector y is an n by 1 vector. If you have n observations, y is an n by 1 vector. But how many observations have we got in here? Well, if they are n series, uh, sorry, n observations, there are n minus 1 differences only. So this is going to be an n minus 1 by 1 vector. Okay, so when we difference, we lose one observation. Now in MATLAB, to do this, there are different ways. The easiest way is to just use the command diff y. So let me do that in MATLAB. Go right, to the editor. Let's say I want to calculate the delta of GDP, the change in GDP. So I'll just say diff US GDP. What do I do? Diff US GDP. And I execute that and I get DGDP. So let us just look at DGDP and uh, GDP and yeah, and yes, GDP. Yes, GDP, DGDP. So let's look at these two. First observation, I'll go at the beginning. You can see here we move from 13.382 to 13.586. So the difference is about 0 0.2, 0.204 and that's what you see here. And then we move from 13.586 to 13.828 the difference is 0 0.2420. So that's what we get. And you can see here from the dimensions that DGDP has 253 observations, US GDP has 254. So we lost one observation. Now if you want to calculate growth rates, and that's something we often want to do, calculate uh, growth rates. 
growth rates are basically the change in a series at a particular time divided by the initial value. So in a way we have all that information which we need for all our observations in these vectors. Okay, Delta y is a vector of changes, that's what we need up here, and y t minus 1. Now y t minus 1, if we want to growth rate, so let's think about the, let's just call it g y for growth rates y, what we want in the first element is y2 minus y1 divided by the value before y2, so divided by 1. So the second growth rate is going to be y3 minus y2 divided by y2 and so forth. So how do we use that using our observations? Well, in MATLAB we can, for the numerator, we want to use diff y, okay, that just gives us these, all these values, we have them here, and then we want to divide by this vector, but what we don't need is that last observation, okay, because we only need t minus 1s, for our last growth rate, yn minus yn minus 1, we want to divide that by yn minus 1, so we need to sort of cut off that vector here, so we'll divide, and in MATLAB, we do this. Uh, uh, I'll just click away this. I need a bit more space, so we wanted to cut it off here. We said so we calculate diff by this gives us all these values, and then we want to divide by y all values but the last value, so that is 1, 2, and minus 1. Okay, And since we have a vector here and a vector here, and we want to divide the corresponding elements in MATLAB, we will have to use a little dot divide. So let's do that in MATLAB. So let's say we want to calculate the growth rate of GDP, called G GDP. So that is going to be a difference, we already calculated, that's GDP, and then dot divide US GDP 1, 2, and minus 1. So that will be the growth rate. 5 growth rate, here we go. So remember these are quarterly growth rates. Okay, so and this is now a series which is not too uncommon. You can see we are, we are finishing 2010, so we can just see the beginning of the uh, of the financial crisis here. You can um, also see sort of all sorts of developments through the U.S. economy. Now we can see here the, the highest growth. Remember quarterly growth. So here we have quarterly growth at around two percent. That's about eight percent growth annually, that's around observations 120, 130, let's just see out of interest what dates these are, go to text where we have our data, 120, 130, that is in the 70s, okay, now this is nominal GDP, if you know your stuff a little bit, you know that there was high inflation, so that may not be translating into real GDP. So here we go, that was the growth rate. Now I said I'll come back to the log rate and you have sometimes you will be asked to calculate the log returns. Now what that means is that we want the difference in the log GDP. Okay, so we have already calculated LGDP and we want the difference. So the difference of LGDP. Okay, let me just calculate that one now. Once we calculated it, I want to show you something. So the LGDP. So we have that we have that here. Okay, this is now our differences in log GDP. So look at the following. I'll highlight 
the log GDP and the growth rate in GDP which we calculated. And I'll plot them both. And uh, that's not exactly what I wanted. Let me just actually I'll write it down here as a command I'll plot. And what I want to plot is um, DL GDP and GG uh, G GDP. Um, so I create a new matrix with two, that's what the square brackets do, with two columns with the two series next to each other and then I plot it. So let me just run this entire stuff. So here we have our data. Now why does it only plot one? Well, it actually does plot two series. Perhaps we can make it a little bit a little bit bigger and you can perhaps just see here that there slide you can see a little bit of blue shimmering through let me just um, zoom in a little bit here and you can see there are two series but they seem to be extremely similar so the difference has come the higher the, va the higher the value so and this is very important the log difference basically calculates for small growth rates exactly the same as the growth rate Okay, and that's what you could see in this little graph. So this is perhaps a good time to actually also upload the second series, the exchange rate. So let me just copy this. Let's call it FX rate is EU. And let's just call that US EU. This series you can execute individual. No, sorry. Here we go. So US EU, we have it here. Let's look at that series. Firstly, you can see it's much longer series, 2009 to 5 observations. This is a daily series of exchange rates. US and Euro exchange rates. Let's just confirm. Oh, I forgot. Uh, I need text. US EU to differentiate it. So we just need to execute again. So we have text US EU. You can see the date. It starts from 1999, 4th of January 1999 to 13th of August 2010. So but that's a daily series. And you can see the interest rates, uh, sorry, the exchange rate is here so we have it behaves very very different to the US GDP of course a different series um, there's not such a clear trend okay first it seems to be going down uh, and then it's going up so and you can see a lot of little variations if I just zoom in a little bit in here, you can see that there's a lot of variation from day to uh, from day to day in the exchange rates. So now, what I really want to look at is some time series characteristics. Time series characteristics. time series characteristics. So like any random variable we can look at the moment. So we can look at the uh, at the mean, at the variance, at the uh, skewness, kurtosis. Okay. Now just let's look at our little graph which we have up here of the US GDP rate. Now you look at this. Let's say we would calculate the the well, hopefully you could hear me, I realize my microphone was a bit skewed. Let's say you would calculate the average GDP for our period, okay? And you would calculate something, let's say an index term even, it comes, around, uh, comes out at perhaps 60. What meaning does that have? What meaning does it have that in the US the GDP was on average in the last 50 years, this and that? 
Uh, it doesn't really have a lot of meaning. And why doesn't it have a lot of meaning? Because the, there is this constant trend, this constant upward trend in the series. Now we'll soon talk about, in the lecture we'll talk about this being a non-stationary series. Okay, And when you have non-stationary series, it doesn't really make sense to calculate averages and perhaps not even variances and kurtosis and skewness. So it doesn't make sense. All these sort of common characteristics which we calculate, they really only make sense for what we will later call formally stationary series. Now, have we seen a stationary series? Well, indeed we have. Let's look at the GDP growth. So this series here, here it would make perfectly sense to calculate the average. That would be the average growth rate. That is a perfectly reasonable number to calculate and to think about. Okay, so that, that's going to be very important. Now one, so these characteristics, these common characteristics, they are really, they in general they're applicable applicable to all random variables to all random variables but do they always make sense and the answer to this I just gave the answer to this is no okay so there is another particular property of time series which I need to talk about, and that's what we call autocorrelation. Autocorrelation. Now, there's a part in this word, I'm not sure every one of you has come across this term, I think possibly most of you, but there's one part in this word, the word correlation, which all of you will have come across. So let's just think about, let's assume you had two random variables. Say you had x and z, and both of these were random variables. Now if you wanted to calculate the correlation between x and z, how would you do that? You would calculate the covariance between x and z, and you would divide that by the square root of the variance of x times the variance of z. So when we're now talking about and actually it might be worthwhile to remind yourself how to calculate the covariance, let's say population covariance, now just assume you know this, um, and this is just a brief reminder, set i minus set bar, so that we need the cross product of these two mean deviations and then divided by the variance as, as above here. So now if we want to calculate autocorrelations, what we mean is auto means something like with itself, okay, correlation with itself. So we want to calculate a correlation, and what are the two things we want to calculate a correlation for? Let's say yt, this is our time series again, and with itself that means yt, well that doesn't quite make sense. What would be the correlation? The correlation of this would be 1. Yeah, it would be perfectly correlated. But perhaps we can consider the correlation between yt and yt minus i. So for instance, if i equals 1, yt minus 1. So correlation between a value of our time series and the value of the period before. Or perhaps the value of a time series and the value two periods before. Then we would have t minus 2. So in general we call this correlation, we often use a little row, so row i, so row 1 would therefore be the correlation between yt and yt minus 1. So how would we calculate that? Well, we'll just go to this formula, instead of x we use yt, and instead of z we use yt minus 1. So here we have yt, and here we use yt minus 1. So let's briefly just write this down. The covariance between yt and yt minus 1 divided by the square root of 
the variance of y t times the variance of y t minus 1. So essentially y t and y t minus 1 are the same thing. Okay? It's the same series, just offset by one period. Therefore, if these are the same, if we look at them individually, these two things are going to be the same thing. Okay, So we have variance times variance, so that would be variance squared, and the square root of the variance squared will just be the variance. So what we basically get here is covariance of by t so, and by t minus 1 divided by the variance of y t. So I don't really want to, to go deeper into the formula. All I want to say here is that, as we'll see in a second, th this number is an interesting number. How are these values correlated with each other? And what's also interesting is to see how this changes if we go to two legs. Okay, What is row 2? What is row 3? And so forth. Now let's look at our data again. We go to MATLAB. And what I'm going to do first, we're going to look at our, let's say, the log GDP. That was our linear, sort of linearized GDP data. So think about how is GDP and the GDP in the previous quarter, how are they related? Well, they seem to be pretty high, highly related, right? There's not a lot of variation from one period to the next. So possibly we expect row 1 to be pretty large row 2 to be pretty large as well. How do we calculate that in MATLAB? Well, I, I've written a little function here, ACFCT, autocorrelation function, and that will be available via Blackboard. And all you need to know is that what you need to do is you define a new variable, let's say temp, or let's say um, L GDP underscore AC for autocorrelations, then you call that function, AC function, you hand in your series, LGDP, and you can already see in the help it asks for how many lags. Basically it's asking you how many autocorrelations do you want to calculate. One lag, up to two lags, up to three lags, let's say up to 20 lags. Okay, so let's just run run this bit of code. So what we get here is a little picture, a little graph. So what we can see here is the sample autocorrelation. Here we see the lags and we can see for lag 1 we have extremely high autocorrelation. Of course the autocorrelation is, an, is a correlation so it will have to be between 1 and negative 1. So the row 1, that's what we have here, what we just looked at, that value is very, very large, okay, almost close to 1. Row 2 is a little bit smaller, but it's still very large, 0.95 approximately. You can see even 20 lags, that's basically 5 years down the track, there's still a correlation of almost 0.3. Now, let's see how that changes for a different series. So instead of LGDP, let's look at the growth rate. Okay, we see it. We look at the autocorrelation function of G GDP. Uh, it? Yes. Here's the picture. Okay. So you can see this is quite this is quite different, although it's still fairly persistent. Okay, it's still far away from from zero. And okay, there's in the growth rates, there's still a lot of persistence. If you have a high growth rate in one quarter, it's very likely you still get a high growth rate in the next quarter. Let's look at the exchange rate data. So we'll look at um, US Hero. US Hero. There's our picture. So you can see again, basically more or less like the GDP, even more extreme, extremely high 
very very high correlation. What about the changes in the exchange rate? Actually we haven't calculated the, uh, the changes yet. Let's do that quickly. Now uh, for exchange rate we often want to look at the changes in the log exchange rate. So we'll calculate DL US Euro. So we want the difference, but we want the difference of the log. Okay, so it's basically like a, a nested function here or two operations in in one. First we calculate the log of US Euro exchange rate and then we calculate the difference. And then we want to look at the autocorrelation function of of that series. So DL US zero. So let's calculate that. And now here we have a very different picture. Now look at the scale of zero here in the center and the maximum correlation is about at about 0 0.05. So all these correlations are very autocorrelation, sorry, are very, very close to zero. And there's no tendency here for this autocorrelation to decrease. Well, it can't because it's basically it starts at zero, okay? So it can't really get much smaller. So there's much less dependence from one period to the next in the exchange in the changes in the exchange rates on the log returns. Let's just actually look at the picture of the of what we just calculated D L U S Euro. Okay, so these are the changes in the exchange rate or exchange rate returns. It's extremely random. It looks very very random. And now you know why speculation with exchange rates with currencies is very very risky because it's very random. It's like playing roulette. So this is really all I uh, wanted to remind you of.